This episode of Gators Breakdown is brought to you by Manscaped. Get 20% off plus free shipping and two free gifts when you purchase the new Perfect Package 3.0 kit with promo code GATORS. Head over to manscaped.com and purchase yours today. Gators Breakdown. The Gators Fan Podcast. Because there's never a dull moment in Gator Nation. The Gators Breakdown Podcast is ready to go. I'm your host, David Waters, and you can find me on Twitter at GatorDave underscore SEC. Going to do something different these next couple of weeks. Since we didn't get spring practice, we also missed out on seeing a lot of major storylines for the 2020 Gators opponents. So I thought it'd be a good idea to get caught up there, and there's going to be guests from each team that will quickly preview each SEC foe along with FSU. So you guys have the latest of what's going on outside of Gainesville. But also, we'll get their thoughts on the Gators. This week's episode will feature Kentucky, Tennessee, South Carolina, LSU, and Ole Miss, the first half of the Power 5 schedule with Georgia, Vanderbilt, Missouri, and FSU coming next week. Before we get into it, a couple quick news and notes around Gator Nation, just in case you missed it. Zach Evans, five-star running back for the 2020 class, is going to TCU. Uh, Bit of surprise there. Uh, I know after the wild recruitment of Zach Evans uh, originally committing to Georgia in the early signing period, looking like he's going to go there, and then not, and then... Of course, announcing leaders of uh, Florida and, and Tennessee in the spring. And then COVID hits. He's never able to take his Florida visit. And there we go. He ends up at TCU. Started hearing rumblings about this last week. Um, and then kind of had to follow it up to, just to kind of make sure. Couldn't get full confirmation, so didn't put much out there. But started hearing some TCU rumblings uh, last week. And it kind of makes sense in a way. Look, he was never going to come to Florida if he couldn't do uh, a visit. I don't think a virtual visit was really going to work here. Um, so, and plus, with everything going on, I think you know being a 2020 commit and, and and signee is a little different than being a 2021 commit and signee. When you think with what's going on in the world out there, you think eventually it's going to clear up. So these 2021 kids, I think. Or you know, it's kind of like a standard recruiting cycle. They they can feel more comfortable about going out of state, going away uh, from home by the time their classes start. You know, in twenty twenty one in the spring, if they're an early enrollee or normal student. If you're still a twenty twenty commit like Zach Evans, and still having to make a decision about where you're going to start classes this week, you can see where his parents kind of want him to maybe stay close to home. Uh, travel restrictions are are still out there. Might be tough to go and enroll in classes in Kingsville or Knoxville or, or somewhere else. So uh, I think maybe the, the hand was dealt and, and kind of forced to where he was going to have to stay kind of close to home uh, right now. And I think that's the way uh, it pretty much worked out here. Uh, in case you missed it, uh, last week we did a pre- our episode right after uh, Isaiah Walker put his name in the transfer portal from Florida. And he has made his decision to transfer to Miami. All I'll say about that really is everybody knows the story uh, of him and and, and transferring, of course. You can go back to listen to uh, last week's episode and what that means for the Gators. Uh, But I think the move to Miami, I don't buy the whole whole homesickness thing. I really don't. I think it's more of a payback move uh, in in a way, for whatever reason. Just did not go right with Florida. Uh, And I think Miami was one of the easiest places for him to go, being down there in South Florida. But I don't think homesickness had had much to do uh, with that move and a bit of uh recruiting news committed um commitment news for the gators in the 2021 class as 2021 offensive lineman adrian strickland from lynn haven florida commits to the gators he's not ranked on either 24 7 sports or rivals but is rated a three-star prospect on rivals while being not rated at all on 24 7 sports he is the gators 13th commitment for the 2021 class Huge frame and size here, 6'6", 330 pounds. He's the fourth offensive col- offensive lineman in the 2021 class for the Gators with George Jackson and Javante Gardner. Um, and the uh, in 2019 signing class member, Diave Hammond, who also should be making his way to Gainesville next year, is going to be in this 2021 class. So, look, of course, the, the rating, 
ranking and, and size are going to draw comparisons to Ethan White. But uh, this is this is a wait and see type of prospect here. Uh, it's definitely hard to teach that size. That's that's a good thing here. But no other you know big schools were after Strickland. None of the the big southeastern conference schools or in state schools were necessarily after Strickland. So yeah, we'll wait and, and see what John Hevesy is able to do once he gets his hands on him and, and develop him to see what kind of you know kind of player Florida is getting here down the road. But I still think there's some wonder where he fits in on the offensive line with that size and frame. Is he a tackle? Is he a guard? Uh, where will he f- kind of mold himself into in years to come? I think will be uh, something uh, to look out for. So about to get started with our kind of opponent whip around coverage, uh, getting you uh, just caught up on the Gators opponents out there since there was no spring practice. But before we do, Remember, you can find Gators Breakdown on news4jacks.com slash Gators Breakdown. You'll find all the Gators Breakdown episodes and News 4 Jacks coverage of the Gators there. Please share, rate, and review the show. Subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform. And follow Gators Breakdown on social media on Twitter and Facebook at Gators Breakdown. And joining us now is Kevin McGuffey, covers Kentucky Wildcats at last word on college football. Kevin, thanks for joining us, and let's get right into it. Mark Stoops returning for his eighth season in Lexington, and you know, seems uh, seems like yesterday he was just hired there. Uh, but you know, after getting everything he could out of last year's team, Wildcat fans have to be pretty happy with the program under his direction. Oh yes, sir. And first, thanks for thanks for having me on again. I always enjoy uh, uh, coming on and get, getting getting to talk with you. But yes, as you said. Cat fans have no nothing should be nothing but happiness up here. Um, as you said, Stoops going in his eighth year. It's hard to believe that it's been eight years. Um, he's um, forty four and forty four overall. Now, while that may you know to the the Florida fans and around the SEC, that may not sound great, but right now I think he's third. I think he's like third now with all time wins at Kentucky. And I'll, um, I'll stop you there, Kevin. Believe me, right now I don't think uh, Gator fans put a lot of respect on Mark Stoops. <laughs> the last two last two years, and even going back to you know the Jim McElwain years, heck, he's good. he's given Florida more trouble than Tennessee has. Uh, yes, yeah, yes, sir. You're right. I was just was going through some 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 numbers just before we before we got started here, and I was if you go back and look at look at Coach Stoops, two games into his fourth season, he was twelve and twenty six at Kentucky. Wow. You know, they start. You know, started two and ten. You know, he inherited a mess from Joker Phillips. Um, two and ten, five and seven, five and seven, and then since then he's gone. Uh, Kentucky's gone thirty-two and eighteen over the last basically four seasons with four straight. You know, four straight bowl games. But even at forty-four and forty or forty-four overall, um, I said, uh, you know, everyone excitement. There's, you know, obviously there's a little. A little trepidation because we're really not sure what's going to happen this year. And um, but the excitement around the program is, is is as big as it's ever been. Honestly, the around the coaching staff, if you you know you talk to them, they think this team could be as good as the team two years ago. Um, they've got they're they're solid in almost every every aspect. And um, but yes, and another thing I mentioned real quickly is. Um, one of the biggest things that happened in the off season was, was coach Stoops holding on to Vince Marrow. Um, he's a ace, ace recruiter, you know, tight ends coach. He, he was offered a job at Youngstown state, which is his home. He turned that down. He was offered a chance to um, take a job, a similar job with uh, Michigan state, uh, turned that down. I think you know, a lot of it was due to a, I think Michigan State just offered him the job because they're getting tired of Kentucky beating them out for recruits in Michigan. But, uh, but no. But to go back to your original point, I, th- I think excitement is as high as, as it's ever been around here. We just we just got to wait and see, you know, see what happens come September. Definitely the question there if we get to play football this fall. Two big questions as far as the Kentucky offense is: How healthy is quarterback Terry Wilson, and how in the heck does Kentucky replace Lim Bowden? <laughs> well, uh, Terry was not I, as just to, a reminder for everyone. He, he tore a, his patellar tendon in his knee in the second game of the season last year, missed the entire season. And then Sawyer Smith, who came in from Troy as a graduate transfer, took over. Then he got hurt. And then that's when they said, OK, let's throw Lynn Bowden out there. He was a high school quarterback. And let's see what happens. And, you know, he went on to one of the most incredible eight-game runs ever. Uh, but Wilson was not going to take part in spring practice. But all the video, you know, things you've seen posted online, 
he looks great. His mobility seems really good. His he's been working on his throwing arm, uh, working on increasing his accuracy. Um, he says he'll be ready to go in September, and you know we have no reason. Us up here have no reason to doubt him. Um, behind him, it is like I said, Sawyer. If something were to happen, Sawyer Smith would be your guy as as the um, as the backup. Then of course you have Joey Gatewood, the Auburn transfer. It, it's doubtful he's going to become eligible this year. Uh, if he did, then the quarterback situation gets a whole lot more interesting. But after Sawyer Smith, you have um, the Cats just had someone, Imani Gilmore, who. Um, was vying for that backup spot, just put his name in the transfer portal. Then behind him, you have Nick Scalzo, um, who's a Florida, I think, from around, down around Miami, and then also Bo Allen, who's an incoming freshman. But for all, all intents and purposes, Wilson looks great, says he feels great, uh, he's ready to go. Now, as far as, as Bo, of course, the, the, the simple answer is how, you know, you can't replace him. But uh, you know, he became, <laughs> he was a third, third round draft pick with the Raiders. Um, he, uh, the, the two names, honestly, that you're going to see are probably Josh Ali. And if you go back and watch the, uh, if you go back and watch the, uh, the belt bowl, he's the, the receiver that made the two, the two big catches on, on the fourth, the fourth long to keep that, that long drive going and, um, and then caught the touchdown pass there at the end, at the end of the game that gave Kentucky the win. Uh, he's going to be probably, he's going to be your, your, your main guy is at the wide receiver position. Another guy to look at is Isaiah Epps. He, um, they were expecting big things out of him last year, but he had a foot injury. He missed all of last season. Um, a couple other names: Bryce Oliver, Cleavon Thomas. There's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of guys out there. There's been, um, it's kind of funny. There's been a little Twitter beef going between Kentucky and Louisville players for whatever reason. The last couple of days, one of the Louisville receivers said, "Yeah." Why would I want to go to Kentucky and you know basically just block for everybody and never catch pass? And of course that that uh, that that started a storm, you know, back and forth, you know, going back the, the fact that Louisville, you know, Kentucky's drilled Louisville the last two years. But obviously you can't replace what Bowden did. But those are the two guys I would look at as Epps and uh, and, and Josh Ali. And Kevin, just kind of looking at Mark Stoops' recent years, and you've kind of mentioned the turnaround in recent years. A lot of that's been due to what Kentucky's done in the trenches, especially the last couple of years. But lose all SEC guard Logan Stenberg, two of three starting defensive linemen, and of course linebacker Cash Daniel as well. Uh, as well, who's going to step up in those spots? Well, the uh, the big blue wall, as they like to call it, is um, despite losing Stenberg, I think they're going to be. It's going to be one of the the. the U- the team's strong points. You have Landon Young returning at tackle. He's a you know off definitely an offensive all SEC potential guy. He he talked about possibly um, going for the NFL and decided to come back for his senior year. Along with him, you've got Drake Jackson um, at center, another guy who looked at going to the NFL but decided to come back. And then the third guy that doesn't get hasn't gotten a whole lot of talk, but he really should is. Um, I'm blanking on the name now. <laughs> Darian Kennard. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, Dar- Darian Kennard at the, the right tackle position. He probably, honestly, if you look at like the pro football focus and all that stuff, he graded out higher than anybody, any, anybody on the offensive line last year. You throw those three guys out there, and you have you know, like Kenneth Horsey and Luke Fortner, another senior who's back this year. I think Kentucky will have. I think they're going to try to throw the ball obviously more this year, but I, I think they're going to have one of the best. I think their offensive line is good. I think they're going to have one of the best, you know, running backs. We did, you know, I did mention the backs earlier, but you think about AJ Rose, Cavassier Smoke, Chris Rodriguez, Travis Tisdale. You have those four guys that they're just going to run. I think it's kind of the thing where you know a guy plays a couple of down, you know, a couple of series, and you bring in the next guy, and then you find out, you know, like with, with Eddie Grand, offensive coordinator, who, who's got the hot hand that day and then that's your um you know that's your guy but i i think the offensive line is going to be is, is going to be is going to be a, a strong suit and then flipping over to defense real quick one of the biggest things that helped this team was phil hoskins the defensive tackle getting granted a um he missed last season being granted a six year of eligibility from the ncaa he's um having him back in in the middle is is going to be huge and then alongside of him, you got Quentin Bohanna and then Josh Pascal, probably your your nose guard and your defensive end. Of course, everybody I think remembers, you know, the story about Pascal had the the 
cancer in his foot and then has recovered and then, you know, played some last year, but has been, um, you know, they're, they're really expecting big things out of him. And as far as the linebacker position, Kentucky is, I would put Kentucky's, you know, obviously Florida every year is always strong on the defense, Georgia, LSU, but I put Kentucky's linebacking core up against anybody's. Uh, Chris Oates is the guy who's probably going to be taking over for Cash Daniel. He's a junior. He played, did did some really good things last year behind him. Jamin Davis, um, that that three four that Kentucky Kentucky uses. You got Jordan Wright, DeAndre Square. I think, but is all of these guys are are under underclassmen, and so I, I think this year and even next year, uh, Kentucky's going to be. I think Kentucky's going to be really strong there. You know, Miss, you know, Daniel, you know, Cash Daniel didn't have as great a senior year as he hoped, and um, but he 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 played really well towards the end of the year. But I, I think between Oates and Davis that they'll be uh, more than more than fill in you know the, the shoes of, of Cash Daniel and Kevin before I let you go of course I mentioned it earlier heck man five last five four five six years Florida Kentucky's had some classic games some classic knockdown drag outs um probably you know probably will expect another one coming up this year as well what's your thoughts on the Gators coming into 2020 and you know whether they can overtake Georgia and just how close you know uh, in these recent battles of Florida and Kentucky? Well, I think um, just, I'm just going to throw it out there. I think if this is, if there's ever going to be here that, 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 that the Florida gets past Georgia, I think it's this one. I, I think Georgia is maybe on a, de- you know, on, on a little downwards, you know, down a little bit down from what they've been the last two or three years. And, and you can see the improvement, you know, under Mullen every year with, with Florida getting a little better, a little better and, you know, closing that gap. And I think honestly, this could be the year. It would not surprise me to see, to see Florida in the SEC championship game this year. Now, as far as Kentucky goes, as you said, four out of the last five years, and I'll honestly, Kentucky probably should have won the game, but you know, it's Kentucky football. <laughs> things, things always seem to happen. And somebody, I can't remember who it was. Somebody had posted the other day that this would be, you know, talking about this season and, you know, Kentucky football and, you know, what football in, in a nutshell this season, is it going to happen? How's it going to happen that this would be the most Kentucky football thing ever to have a potential nine or 10 win season and then not have a football season? <laughs> yeah. Florida fans feel the same way with, yeah. Like, look, we can, we can finally compete with Georgia this year and, right. you know, we'll see, no, if, I, we'll see if the season I, even I, happens. Yes, sir. I absolutely think, and I'm not just saying this, I really believe it. I, I think, I when when we get to when we get to the summer and I do my um, SEC preview, you know, for gas, last word on college football, I would not be surprised to see me have Florida, Florida playing in the SEC title game. But again, I I think, but going on the other thought of that, with the, the possibility of football, are we going to have football with no fans? Are we going to have you know limited fans? And how interesting, you know, obviously two years ago Kentucky beat Florida in the swamp. You know, Kentucky goes to Florida, Tennessee, and Al- Auburn this year, and who knows? You know, playing those three games is mm-hmm. three of the toughest, three of the toughest places to play in the league, and honestly, in the country. Uh, what's it going to be like if there's no fans? If there's no, you know, if there's limited limited fans, um, it, it's you know, it's a whole new world right now. But I think I, I, I like I think Kentucky could come in to Florida and win that game. Like just much like they did two years ago, but it would not surprise me, obviously, for Florida, Florida to win and Florida to win handily. It just we just it's second game of the season. You know, Terry Wilson may still be, you know, filling out, getting some rest out, and um, but now, like I said, I, going back to your original point, I, I would not it would not surprise me to see Florida win the SEC this year. Yeah, but I, I say these two teams get together recently, and there's been some uh, been some classic games, some crazy comebacks, and. Inexcusable plays and, uh, and and kind of <laughs> and that's just and that's just on Kentucky's end. But anyway. <laughs> hey, like you said, two years ago, you know, Kentucky just pounding Florida uh, in the swamp to give uh, you know Mullen his first loss as the Gator head coach. So plenty of storylines when these two teams uh, match up for sure. Kevin, man, I can't thank you enough uh, for giving us a preview of this Kentucky Wildcats, and I hope everything stays safe, man. Oh, thank you, David. I appreciate it, and uh, hopefully everything, everybody's everybody's safe down your your guys' way, and everybody down the great sunshine state everybody's doing well and, and hopefully we can we can talk again closer to september when there's a, when there's going to be actual football
<laughs> Nathaniel Rutherford, managing editor and lead content creator at Rocky Top Insider, joins us next to preview the Tennessee Volunteers. And Nathaniel, a hot ending the last season for Tennessee, and some recent transfers have uh, optimism pretty high in Knoxville. Yeah, and that with the uh, all the recruiting stuff going on, obviously the guys at Tennessee's landing in the 21 class aren't going to be able to help the team this fall. But it's been a nice offseason for Tennessee where you have not had a, a lot of bad news necessarily. And, yeah, there's there's a lot of optimism for Tennessee heading into this 2020 season. Uh, how much is that? You know the the last uh, you know the last basically month of the season last year uh, for, for Tennessee ending the ending the season pretty hot and in that comeback victory versus Indiana uh, here in Jacksonville in the Gator Bowl. Uh, how much has the the reasons for optimism got to do with that late season surge? I think it has to do with that because I mean not only did you end the season on a six game winning streak, but you did it after you started the year. I mean disastrously with the loss to Georgia State, losing to BYU in double overtime, and then you lost in blowout fashion to Florida and to Georgia, and you're sitting there one and four with your early victory against an FCS team. And, and fans are thinking, is Tennessee going to get three or four wins this year? And I mean, we, we talked about that multiple times on our podcast and stuff about, you know, what's what exactly is going to happen with this team? Next thing you know, the only loss they have to end the season is against Alabama. And they actually gave Alabama a decent fight in that game. Of course, they went they were down uh, to a, that game. Mac Jones came in after two got hurt. But still, I think it was the way Tennessee ended it with the, the way the defense plays, specifically because the defense played pretty well down the stretch. Um, and the way they had, they, you know, they came back and beat Indiana in the bowl game. I think it gives fans a lot of optimism because you saw a lot of younger guys step up and, and take steps. That, that defensive line heading into last season was a huge question mark. They lost all their starters and a couple of the role players from the previous season. So you had a brand new up defensive line. And as the season went along, they got better and better and, you know, they were never top tier in the SEC, but they, they were serviceable by the end. And now you're returning all of those guys, along with a few more uh, guys you're bringing in from this 2020 class. Bring it back, Trey Smith in the offensive line. You got Kate Mays as a transfer from Georgia, who hopefully, they're, even if they don't pass the one-time transfer rule, it seems like there's optimism he can get eligible for the season. I mean, Tennessee, on the lines of scrimmage on both sides of the ball, they're going to have pretty stout lines and a lot of experience on those lines. And I think that's where there's been a lot of optimism because I think all fans necessarily aren't super confident in Tennessee's quarterback situation but I think they really like what, what the Vols have on the offensive line and defensive line and what they can do in the run game on offense too. Well that's exactly where I was going next. Well, you know, one of the bigger questions in the SEC is if Jarrett Grantano can, can, can be the guy to take that next step uh, and, and progress from last season uh, but if not him other quarterbacks Mauer, JT Stroud as well uh, maybe even highly touted freshman Harrison Bailey. You know, are, are those, would those guys be ready to take over if they had to? If Grantano doesn't show the progression, I think Tennessee is one of those teams that didn't get, they just, they didn't hurt a whole lot from missing out in spring practice. You look at some teams that you know they're younger or have a lot of new parts coming in. Those teams really, you know, I probably really wish they could have had the spring practice this year, but obviously because of the coronavirus stuff, you know, Tennessee only got two practices in. That's fine for the most part, but I think the one part where it did hurt them was that quarterback because I think this spring was going to be huge for Tennessee's quarterback room because they had five guys in there as scholarship guys because you had two early enrollees with Harrison Bailey and Jimmy Holiday in there in this 2020 class. I think if you if had a full spring, I would have been very curious to see what Harrison Bailey would have looked like you know, in game-like situations in the orange and white game in, in April. It seemed kind of how he progressed and what he could do because I think he has a ton of potential. Now, without him having those practices and without this being kind of a standard summer um, you know, session coming through with the weight training, whatnot that you would normally do with your your strength staff and everything. I, I don't I don't see a way that Garantano is not your starting quarterback to start the season unless he you know suffers some sort of injury or something like that. And to me, it's going to be whether or not he and I, I think the biggest problem with him last year was I don't think he felt the competition. He, he was basically named the starter in spring, and he you know I would say he cruised to that job, but he, he did a good job in practice. And everyone I ever talked to who saw you know more practice than what we get to see as the media. I said he looked fine in practice. As when he got the game day, it just kind of, for whatever reason, didn't connect. So I, I think he'll be your starter at the beginning of the season, but I, I think his leash will be somewhat short because you have guys on this roster with experience with Brian Maurer and JT Stroud who played last season. You have Harrison Bailey, who is a highly talented freshman, who I think this coaching staff likes. I'll, I'll just be curious to see kind of what their confidence is with him and, you know, what happens in fall. Do we, do we get a full fall camp? How's that going to work? I, I just think this, you know, Overall, it doesn't hurt Tennessee as much as other teams, but at the quarterback position, I do think it hurt Tennessee as far as you know not getting to have those spring practices and having kind of a, a weird offseason in general. Yeah, and one aspect it probably hurts is got to make a, a rapport with these new receivers uh, out there. Mm-hmm. And of course, Juwan Jennings, Marquez Callaway, no longer with Tennessee. Uh, what's uh, Who can we expect to step up there with those two guys going? 
right now the odds on favorite to be the number one guy was the number three guy last year. That's Josh Palmer. Uh, he, 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 to me, I think has a lot of potential. He's been the third fiddle to Jennings and Callaway. He had 400 plus receiving yards in 2018, 400 plus receiving yards last year. So he's a guy who's been here for a couple of years. He's a senior now. Um, I like what he has. He's a big body, but also can move. You also have the transfer from Georgia, D'Angelo Gibbs, who sat out this last season. Um, did the transfer roles, and he was a, a defensive back at Georgia, but he played defensive back and wide receiver at Grayson High School, and he came to Tennessee, and they switched his receiver. And from all accounts, from everything I've, I've heard and you know, talked to people at UT and stuff, he was doing a really good job in the scout team in the fall. Granted, that it's a scout team. It's, it's a totally different thing, but he has turned some heads, and he seems to have some good playmaking ability. Those are probably your two main guys that I would say to kind of circle and keep an eye on would, would be Palmer and Gibbs. Brandon Johnson, has, you know, he registered last year as a senior to – it was to retain some eligibility and come back when he'd have more playing time. I think he's going to get in the mix. And you're going to have a few young guys get in here. Some of the signees that Tennessee had in this 2020 class, like Jalen Hyatt, um, who's a speedster, and Malachi Weidman, who is, I mean, I'm sure you all have seen his highlights and stuff. He's just a, a highlight machine, the way he can leap and his, his athleticism, too. I expect those two guys to kind of get some playing time as younger guys. So I, I think you're going to, it's going to be a new kind of group, but it's going to be a group I think that has a lot of potential. I don't not expect them to replace what. Jennings and Callaway did, but uh, I do think it's going to be an exciting group to kind of watch this year. You mentioned the uh, turnaround on defense last year, but you know, many returners uh, on that defense do return, but some big superstars, of course, now that Tennessee has to fill the void for Daniel Batuli, Daryl Taylor at linebacker, Nigel Warrior at safety. Uh, what's going to happen there with those guys? My biggest concern on defense for Tennessee is going to be the depth at, at linebacker. That that was an issue for them last year because they already had a little bit of depth concerns. And then in the middle of the season, you had the attrition where a couple of guys do, do, do not gain playing time and stuff ended up transferring, uh, which, it, you know, that happens. And they ended up having, I mean, at the beginning of the spring practices this year, for America, I think they had more scholarship quarterbacks than scholarship inside linebackers. Oh, I think they had four, four on because he will one for reason. Corbett's Crouch was um, you know sidelined because he had offseason surgery, so he was recovering from that. So you had Henry Toto, who's obviously you know was a freshman All American, really good, and then you had JJ Peterson, who has yet to live up to his potential at Tennessee. Aaron Beasley, who was a converted safety, down to moved him inside the linebacker, and then Salome Page the third, who's rarely played at Tennessee, and he's a I think he's a redshirt junior, redshirt senior. That's it. Tennessee is bringing in a few more guys from this 2020 class uh, as signees like Bryson, uh, Bryson Easton and Martavis French are four stars. But I, my, my concern is going to be that that depth of the inside linebacker position and outside because Tennessee doesn't have, now they've lost Darrell Taylor, they don't really have a proven kind of edge rusher as an outside linebacker spot. So that, that's going to be interesting to see what can this linebacker group do. It's a young group with a lot of potential, um, but I, 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 to me, they've got to find an edge rusher. They've got to find a way to get more pressure on the quarterback other than, you know, this, this standard defensive end that's going to be in your three, four front because they can't do that. Um, it's going to be, it's going to be hard to, you know, create the turnovers, create the turnovers and do the stuff that Jeremy Pruitt wants to do with this defense. And uh, to wrap, wrap this up here, you know, what are your thoughts on the, uh, the Gators here? Of course, uh, Gator audience here <laughs> on Gators breakdown and looks to be a you know, Florida Georgia battle and we get the SEC media days or virtual SEC media days whatever it is I'm sure those uh those two teams will be the the ones garnering most of the votes here uh you know in Tennessee is kind of ramping up and, and maybe thought to be that third team uh in that slot right now uh, how would you preview uh, like a, a potential matchup you know between uh Florida and Tennessee right now I think to me looking back in this last season Felipe Franks to me, or excuse me, Felipe Franks, the Kyle Trask, excuse me, was the uh, the biggest surprise to me of the SEC season. I think. I mean, there, there were well, I guess you could say Joe Burrow probably was too, but of the SEC East at least, I think Kyle Trask was the biggest surprise. He really played really well. Um, obviously, his first really big moment was against Tennessee um, last season, and he played really well against the balls. And then from then on out, just I mean, he looked really good. Uh, for all, all season, I, I'd be very curious to see with a with a season of, of coaches in the SEC. You know, getting to watch his film, getting to see his tendencies, and with with his staff at Tennessee specifically, they're all very good defensive minds. Pruitt, Derek Ansley, those are all really good defensive minds. I'll be curious to see what they can do to try to you know limit what he did last season. I still think I still think Florida's going to beat Tennessee. I, that's a game that I think will be closer than what it has been in the last few years. But I, I'm not ready to predict that that's going to be a win for Tennessee um, just yet. I, I think it'll help. They're back in Knoxville this season, which would be a help for Tennessee. But at the same time. To me, unless Tennessee gets above average to good quarterback play, 
I don't know that they're going to be able to beat any of the four big teams on their schedule. That's that's Florida, Georgia, Oklahoma, and Alabama. They get good to you know above average to good quarterback play with the defense they have and with the running game they have. I Tennessee could pull off one of those upsets. I, I just don't know that's going to be Florida or whatever it is. But I, I think I think this year's game will be exciting. I just am not ready to you know pull that trigger and say Tennessee's pulling that upset because I, I don't think they will at this point. At this point. And coming from the Tennessee side, I, I've expressed my I've expressed my notion of what uh, I think about Jamie Newman and and not living up to the hype. Uh, a lot of people were throwing out there, but uh, for, for the you know us kind of previewing one of the other uh, big rivals that we both have, you buy into the Jamie Newman hype in Georgia? I'm not ready to buy in yet. I think he's going to be good. It's it's weird to me that he's being lauded already as potentially the best quarterback in the East or best quarterback, even in the SEC. I, I just, you know, I'm not ready to buy into that yet. I mean, I don't know who he's going to have the ball to throw to a whole lot. It doesn't like Georgia has a, a ton of really gifted receivers right now. If, if there's the one thing if they had you know, the receivers they had a couple years ago, or if they had what Florida had you know, a year or two ago at that wide receiver, but they don't, um, he'll be helped. They have a good offensive line. It'll be helped because they have a good running, a rushing attack. I just not ready to buy into the hype. Yeah. I mean, he could prove me wrong. I mean, I, I, you know, I wasn't sure Joe Burrow was going to be really good. The next next thing you know, he's one of the Heisman and you know set records and stuff this past season. Um, to, be, although, to be fair, I don't think anyone was was predicting that going to happen. Yeah. But I, I think Newman's good. I think he's going to be a, a good option for Georgia this year. I think he can do some things for that offense. I'm just I'm not as high on him as I guess Georgia fans are. And I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he'll prove me wrong. But I I, I just don't think he's going to be the hands down best quarterback in the SEC East or best quarterback in the SEC. Right there with you, right there with you. Yeah, he's he, he's good enough, and they got enough talent around him uh, to, yeah. to, to make him a good quarterback. But uh, the the hype of the Heisman hype and the SEC's best quarterback hype, uh, I, I got to see more. I got to see more as well. So, Nathaniel, man, I can't uh, thank you enough for joining us here, uh, giving us a preview of the Volunteers. Uh, since we didn't get any spring practice, I uh, want to give our listeners uh, you know, a listen out there and, and catch up of uh, Florida opponents. And I uh, couldn't think of anybody better to preview for Tennessee. So thank you for hopping on Gators Breakdown. Hey, David, I appreciate it a whole lot. Thanks for having me on. Let's take a second to thank our sponsors at Manscaped. Flowers are blooming, the grass is growing, and it's time to mow your lawn. Thanks to our sponsor at Manscaped, you can trim the hedges below the belt safely and efficiently. Manscaped is the only men's brand dedicated to below-the-waist grooming and hygiene. Manscaped is forever changing the grooming game with their Perfect Package 3.0 Essentials Kit. The Perfect Package 3.0 kit comes with the new and improved Lawnmower 3.0 waterproof cordless body trimmer and a ton of other liquid formulations to round out your manscaping routine. This third generation trimmer features a cutting edge ceramic blade to prevent manscaping accidents, nick free shaving thanks to Manscaped's advanced skin safe technology. And of course, let's not forget about the Crop Preserver, an anti chafing ball deodorant and moisturizer. You already put deodorant on your armpits, so why are you not putting deodorant on the smelliest part of your body? When you purchase the new Perfect Package 3.0 kit at Manscaped.com, you get the biggest bang for your buck. Subscribers get a new replacement blade refill for your lawnmower trimmer delivered to your door every three months, making sure your trimmer always stays fresh and clean. And for a limited time, subscribers get not one, but two free gifts. The Shed Travel Bag, a $39 value, and the patented, high-performing, anti-chafing Manscaped Boxer Reefs. This is the perfect package for your perfect package. So right now, get 20% off plus free shipping with the code GATORS at manscaped.com. That's 20% off plus free shipping with the code GATORS at manscaped.com. Will Gunter, co-host of the early game on 107.5 The Game in Columbia, South Carolina, joining us here on Gator Breakdown to give us a quick preview of the South Carolina Gamecocks. And Will, man, certainly a tough schedule last season. Big win over Georgia. Injury at quarterback all led to a 4-8 and eight season. So a slew of staff changes after all that. And, of course, a bit of pressure on Will Muschamp. But just how much pressure, Will? I think there's, you know, I think there's a lot. I think there's a lot. And I don't know if he's in – I think it would still take a, a a pretty epically bad season, another four and eight type season for him to lose his job. I, I think the general feeling here is that uh, he will probably definitely get two years, um, uh, just uh, barring a complete collapse this year. But th- there's there's no doubt now that people up here are are a little hungry. They they remember what uh, there's a lot of people now who's starting to maybe 
realized Steve Spurrier quitting was not such a not such a bad thing. We shouldn't be so angry at him, and they're starting to to wish for those days again. And so Will Muschamp has got some talent in place. I, I think he's got some really good players on the roster, and they need to produce, and they need to produce uh, really when football starts back. Ryan Helensky is the the man at quarterback now after getting thrusted in last year. There has to be some kind of expectation uh, of elite now getting to work with uh, Mike Bobo, right? Well, I, you know, it's going to be interesting. South Carolina brought in another very high-end quarterback in Luke Doty that uh, a lot of people compare favorably to Connor Shaw. And uh, Doty is actually probably a little bit faster. Shaw just – Connor Shaw made the most of his work ethic and certainly having uh, Steve Spurrier as his coach didn't hurt. But – you know, I, I don't think that it's just this foregone conclusion that Ryan Holinsky is is the man. I, I think that he's likely going to be the guy. Uh, I'm fascinated to see his development under Mike Bobo. I I think that you know he at times last year showed immense potential and that he can be an upper echelon SEC quarterback. And then there were times where he really struggled. And uh, you know, I don't think that it's just a a given, a surefire given answer to say, well, he's going to be the guy whenever we start football again. But I, I do I do agree that being with Mike Boba, there's there's gonna be maybe a little bit more pressure on him to to take it another step in during his sophomore year. But you gotta tell me how, how tough is it going to be for Helensky or whoever the quarterback is after losing Rico Dattle, uh, Feaster, Denson at running back, Brian Edwards at wide receiver. Uh, you know yes, South Carolina went four and eight last year, but I think that's part of the problem. I think everybody saw potential <laughs> with some of the playmakers uh, there that are, are now, you know, mo- moved on. Um, you know, wh- whoever is that quarterback, you know, how tough is it going to be to replace those guys? Well, I think running back will be interesting. You talk about bringing in Marshawn Lloyd, who's one of the, the top five running backs in the country. I think on, on rivals, he ended up as a five star. I think he was right there at it on uh, on 24-7 sports. So you're talking about one of the elite running back prospects in the country that South Carolina was able to beat out Georgia and Ohio State for. Um, that, that certainly will help. They've got another man behind him named Deshaun Fenwick, who I haven't really understood why. But uh, three times in his career, he's he's gotten ten plus carries, and two times he's gone for over a hundred yards. And he's a guy that, again, South Carolina beat out Georgia and Miami for uh, two years ago. He was a redshirt freshman uh, this past year, and he's a guy who's got a lot of potential. So I think the running back position uh, should be pretty good. And then I think the next step with that is when you talk about the offensive line. And South Carolina returns uh, pretty much six guys that have some kind of starting experience in their career. They do need to find a center. That's going to be the, the interesting thing. And then they're going to play another guy, a seventh guy, Jazden Turrentine, who was a junior college prospect who, who enrolled in campus on, in January. He's got a chance uh, to likely earn the left, the left tackle job. And I think if that happens, then you're talking about a pretty deep and pretty athletic offensive line that at times last year was, was pretty solid. Uh, in terms of running the football effectively against Georgia, running the football effectively against Florida, uh, running the football effectively against Alabama, uh, and then whatever happened late in the season when apparently Appalachian State was the best defensive line they faced, I guess. But, but the bottom line is, is that that was that was inconsistency. And I think you talk about guys that have shown the ability to do it. Wide receiver is going to be the, the the concern. You're exactly right there. You lose Brian Edwards. Uh, who, who leaves with a lot of records. And South Carolina has been so inconsistent at the wide receiver position. Shy Smith has shown flashes to be pretty good. Or Trey Smith has been hurt. Uh, a lot of people are excited about Xavier Leggett, uh, who, who had a couple catches last year. But the, the wide receiver position, there's not a guy that's going to keep defensive coordinators or secondary coaches up at night right now. Because quite frankly, it's, it's guys with some potential, but not much production. Moves to the other side of the ball here in the defense. Loses stalwarts up front, Javon Kenlaw and DJ Wanham. But you know, Muschamp, you mentioned recruiting earlier just a bit. He's recruited so well uh, on that side of the ball, especially up front for the Gamecocks. But, man, it's got to hurt to lose those guys up front and, and, and not going through a spring to try and find some kind of rotation up front. Well, yeah, I think it would have been fascinating to see what Tracy Rocker could have done uh, with the spring because South Carolina has recruited – really, really well up front. Rick Sandage was a guy that, again, they beat Georgia for 
and, and actually played really well against Georgia last year, and he enters his junior year. Zach Pickens was a five-star defensive lineman that, that they went in and got in last year. He was a freshman. Um, you have some other guys there that have shown potential. Kier Thomas is back. Brad Johnson is back. So there is there is a lot of players on that defensive front. And, and one of those guys that wouldn't have mattered during the spring but will matter when we get going again is, is Jordan Birch, who South Carolina was able to hold on to and land. And so, you know, I, I think it's going to be fascinating to see just how much they missed Javon Kinlaw because in years past, we probably would have looked at that and been like, man, what a gaping hole. But there's actually a lot of talent there that could step in and, and maybe fill that void, which is, I think, speaks volumes to the way Will Muschamp is recruited. Uh, at linebacker, uh, you, you've got some guys that have performed better. I think they've been a little subpar the last two years, but, but you've started to see some development there. Uh, I'll be fascinated to see the a guy like Ernest Jones, who's been pretty good, but needs to take the next step. But again, having a defensive line that allows you to, to move and, and get into gaps and make plays is important. And then you mentioned the secondary. And, uh, you know, the biggest, I think the biggest surprise of the Will Muschamp era at South Carolina has been how bad the safety play has been. And then the, the inability to recruit an elite safety. Uh, we'll see if they've got one this year. You mentioned McQuamu, he's back at defensive back with J.C. Horn, but they may move him to safety. Uh, he, he's a guy that maybe steps in. Cam Smith was a, a big-time recruit that redshirted last year that could play defensive back or could play cornerback. Uh, they've got some bodies again, but but you've got to get more consistent play from the safety position, which has been atrocious, which, again, with given that that's Will Muschamp's position, uh, that's been a, quite a surprise, uh, really, in, in, in his three years, four years here in Columbia. I don't know why I thought McQuamu left. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, well, what what did what did South Carolina miss the most uh, about not having spring practice this spring? Well, I, I think it it is. Uh, I think it's both the combination of Tracy Rocker being able to, to work with some talented young defensive linemen. I think you know you look at Tracy Rocker's background as a as a coach and a guy who can develop talent. Uh, and and it, there's a proven track record there. And South Carolina has some good defensive linemen that I think, again, I go back to what, what I saw them do last year at times. Uh, really, in an eight period, you know, you, you go back and you look at what South Carolina did in back-to-back weeks against Georgia and Florida. And I know the Florida game gets away from them. Um, that, that's a whole other storyline there. The defensive line performed pretty well in both of those games against your top two teams in the East and and kind of held up. And so there is talent there. And to have a, a guy like Tracy Rocker coaching them up, I think would have been uh, would have been very very instrumental to the defense being better. And then obviously on the flip side, when you bring in Mike Bobo, uh, Ryan Helinski needed as many reps as possible. They are making an adjustment with how they want to run the offense, a little bit more high formation. So when you're changing things up. Certainly having all 14 practices and then a spring game is, is pretty doggone important. And then quite quite honestly, I, I'll just say this too, and that this is this is different because right now you're not getting that there was a change in strength and conditioning coach. And you go from Jeff Dillman, who you know, I, I think was a terrific guy and, and may be a great coach, but for whatever reason, South Carolina has just had a slew of injuries under that the previous strength and conditioning staff, and Paul Jackson comes in from Mississippi. I think not having the strength and conditioning program to be able to run it like you normally would uh, for now, what is what is it, the last, I guess, almost 60 days, I guess 45, 60 days, is, and, then, and then you're not really going to probably have it in June or July. I think that's just as important as being able to implement your offense or work with those defensive linemen. Absolutely, Darren. Will, before I let you go, man, thoughts on the SEC? You kind of mentioned how South Carolina hung tough with, with Florida and Georgia last year, the top two teams uh, in, in the SEC East. Do you see it playing that way? Is it, is it those two teams uh, at, at the top, how are you handicapping the SEC East? You know, with a, with a kind of, you know, for the podcast purpose here of a, of a lot of Gator fans, in particular on the Florida side. Yeah, I think, you know, the East, I think, is really, really interesting um, because I, I don't, you know, I, I, I was so down on Florida uh, going into last year and, and really was not a big fan of, of Dan Mullen. I, I like Dan Mullen as a coach, but I didn't like the makeup of his team because I, I didn't think Felipe Franks had what it took to 
to get Florida over the hump. And, you know, you, 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 you go back and you look at that Kentucky game for Florida, and, you know, they're losing, and it, and it looks like things are going to go downhill, and then Franks gets injured, and Kyle Trask comes in. And I think that saved Florida's season, quite honestly. And, and uh, you know, watching it here in Columbia, I think also Florida got some breaks, I think, throughout the season. But you you start with quarterbacks, and Ryan Holinsky's not proven. Uh, you know, Vanderbilt, they, they played multiple quarterbacks last year. Missouri's going to probably have Sean Robinson as another grad transfer quarterback. Terry Wilson's back at Kentucky. Uh, but but it brings me around to Georgia. And I'm not a fan of Jamie Newman, the, the transfer from, from Wake Forest. And so I, I don't know how – I think it's, it's maybe a step backwards for the East this year uh, as a whole. I, I'd probably lean toward Florida being the team I would vote for uh, if we went to – Atlanta for SEC Media Day. Uh, I don't think there's any question it's it's still Florida and Georgia. Tennessee, I, I'm not willing to buy into the Tennessee hype yet. They're still a quarterback short. Uh, I know that Garantano and and uh, the third string guy whose name I can't not Brian Mauer, but the, the other guy, uh, the ba- random Bailey. Yeah, random random third string guy comes <laughs> off the bench in South Carolina and they get chewed up because South Carolina safeties couldn't play dead in a Western, but. You know, the, the, to go back to that, I'm not buying the Tennessee thing. I, I'm not buying that ball game. And and as crazy as it sounds, I do think South Carolina talent wise isn't is is far behind Florida and Georgia as four and eight suggests. Um, I don't. I would never dare pick South Carolina to win the East in in 2020. But I think you know, uh, South Carolina, Missouri, Kentucky. I think those are the three teams that, that you look at that could be a thorn in the side to Florida and Georgia, depending on when they play or, or what time the game is played or you know who's who play, who you play the week after, who you play the week before. I, I like Mark Stoops. I, I think he's a really good coach, just he's at Kentucky, and, and I, I think Missouri's still got some talent left. I'm just not buying into the Tennessee thing just yet. All righty, yeah, like you said, Brian Mauer, Garantano, uh, maybe Harrison Bailey there for Tennessee. Uh, the, I, I think that, that that's the biggest question. You know, one of the biggest questions in the East is uh, maybe who ends up the Tennessee quarterback by the time the the, the season ends. <laughs> but, so yeah, Garantano starts the season, uh, but you know, do they rotate quarterbacks much like they did last year? Uh, so we will, yeah, we'll see what happens there. Uh, as you said, I think a lot of it does depend on quarterback play and Kyle Trask at least the Gators there. So. Uh, I think that is a, a leg up for, for the Gators as well. So, well, man, I can't thank you enough for uh, joining us here and, and giving us a quick preview of the South Carolina Gamecocks, uh, co-host of the early game on 107.5, the game in Columbia, South Carolina. Will, thanks, man. I always appreciate it. Y'all take care, Donner. Brody Miller from The Athletic, LSU beat reporter there, joining us to give a preview of these LSU Tigers. And all right, Brody, after the uh, national championship, it was expected there would be a lot of change at LSU, but not sure anyone could have expected as much as there actually was. Give us a quick review of just how many coaches and players have departed LSU since hoisting that trophy. Yeah, I mean, you know, you start with the fact that they're replacing, you know, 15 starters from this team. And obviously a lot of those were seniors, but they had, I believe, I want to say eight or nine underclassmen declare. So yeah, I mean, they, I mean, they they always knew this was going to be a rebuilding year. I don't know if they really saw it being this much of one. So that's fifteen starters, probably eighteen when you loop in, you know, just key contributors. And then from a coaching point of view, they lose, you know, passing game coordinator Joe Brady, who you know it's been well documented was you know one of the main kind of masterminds behind that offense this season. They lose, they lose him. They lose defensive coordinator Dave Aranda is off to Baylor. They lose, uh, you know, running backs coach Tommy Robinson. They kind of let walk. They lose uh, defensive line, former defensive line coach uh, Dennis Johnson, which is its own confusing situation. But he left for Baylor. I mean, they're replacing a bunch of their top analysts. I mean, yeah, there's it's it's going to be a very new looking LSU. But at the same time, they do bring back, you know, obviously Ed Ogeron, offensive coordinator Steve Ensminger, still in place. Um, and, and they still have, you know, star players like Jamar Chase who won the Blitnikoff and Derek Stingley Jr. who might have been the best corner in America as a true freshman. So, But there will be a lot of new faces with LSU this year. Absolutely, and headlining the offense, of course, you mentioned it, replacing the Joes, Joe Burrow and Joe Brady. Look, it, it's not fair to compare Miles Brennan to Joe Burrow and, and what he did last season, but what can we expect from him giving uh, everything that is also changing so much around him you know, compared to last year's skill players, the offensive line, Scott Linehan comes in as the offensive coordinator. I guess how much 
are we expecting it to stay the same and how much are we expecting it maybe to look a little different? Yeah. So the thing to keep in mind is that whenever you talk about miles Brennan, it's funny because this is a school that has been used to pretty average to below average quarterback play for decades. Right. So my actual expectation for miles Brennan in 2020 is he has a loaded receiving core with Jamar chase, Terrace Marshall. He's got you know, Eric Gilbert coming in. He's the highest rated tight end in 24 seven sports history. You know, they, they have a lot of talent around him. That's going to make his life really easy. They finally have an offensive scheme that is in place. Like, yes, they lose Joe Brady, but the offense is there. Steve Enzringer is still the guy who was calling most of those plays. So I'm not denying that Brady's a big loss, but the offense is still in place. So Miles Brennan is actually inheriting a pretty good situation. And what I'd say is, and it's funny, is that Miles Brennan, I would predict, is going to put up numbers that would have broken every LSU passing record if Joe Burrow wasn't there last year. So that's what kind of makes the way people are going to judge him so unfortunate is that he's always going to be looped to one of the best quarterback seasons of all time when what he might do next season might actually be better than anyone who came before Joe Burrow. So, I mean, I think it's a reasonable expectation to see him throw for, I don't know, 3,500 yards and, you know, 30 touchdowns and be a pretty, he might have his flaws. I don't think he's going to be a Davey O'Brien or candidate or anything like that, but I think he's going to be a pretty good quarterback because he has a massive arm. He's a smart guy. His biggest problem really was things like weight. He was really thin. He's up to 216 now. He's put on basically 30 or 40 pounds since his freshman year. You know, things like that. They worried about his, you know, his his ability to take hits in the pocket and deal with all that. Well, I mean, that's improved a lot now that he's gained that weight and he's had more experience. So I don't think he's going to be a star quarterback, but let's put it this way. I think he's going to be a, a B-plus caliber guy, which is still better than what they're used to. The uh, passing game got the headlines, but Florida fans found out firsthand who Clyde edwards alaire is and what he did to Florida last year. Uh, what's going to be the replacement there for him? Yeah, that's going to be a fun one to follow. I think it's probably one of the more interesting battles to watch this spring, or would have been more, one of the better ones this spring, is they have a lot of good names there. They just don't have any one superstar guy. But I guess I'd remind myself that Clyde edwards alaire did not even look like an average starter going into the season, and now he's a first-round pick. But, yeah, they have three guys who I think will share that role. There's Tyrion Davis Price, who was second on the team in carries last year. He's you no know, your 220 pound kind of real downhill runner, kind of like an old school LSU back. And he's really good. He ran for I want to say five yards per carry last season and about 500 yards. Then there's Chris Curry, who is a junior and a guy who, you know, he, he's another really big Marshawn Lynch type body who was actually at the bottom of the depth chart and then rose up really fast and when. Clyde edwards missed most of the Peach Bowl. It was Chris Curry who shocked everyone, got the start, and played really well. And I'd actually actually probably put him at the number one spot right now, which was a big surprise. And then the other wild card in this is John Emery, who was a top 10 player in the 2019 signing class. He was five-star running back out of Louisiana. He's a big play, finesse, just really exciting running back. And I think... You know, he had to get his eyesight fixed. I think he had to really mature in a lot of ways. So it's time will tell if he's ready to be a main guy. But I think between those three, Steve Ensminger said last two weeks ago in an interview, he told all of them, all three of you are starters. So I think it will be a running back by committee situation where all of them kind of do different things. I think because of what we're dealing with right now in the world and COVID, I don't, and missing spring practice, not getting spring practice. I don't think, I know, I'm sure LSU fans and, and the LSU media have talked plenty about it, but I think it's getting kind of buried that Bo Pelini is actually returning to LSU a bit. Uh, <laughs> it, it, for whatever reason, I don't know why it just hasn't caught on big time like I think it would have if everything was normal. Um, what's been the reaction of, uh, of Pelini in his return to Death Valley? Yeah, it's it's been re- uh, one of the more fascinating reactions because it was, I think the initial reaction when that happened was this mixture of, really like this guy who like hasn't been around major football in like seven years, really that's who you're hiring. And then, and then there's kind of this thing where you dig a little deeper and realize, okay, even when he was in Nebraska, he was unanimously considered one of the best defensive minds in football. And he was a really good defensive coordinator. And I don't think anybody ever really denied. He was one of the, you know, when he was at, when he was still coaching at this level was one of the, you know, five, six, seven best defensive minds in football. And then you're like, well, then why was he at Youngstown State for six years, you know? And then you start looking at, well, he was still collecting that big buyout. He wouldn't have been able to get that if he was at another major D1 school. And then you look at, well, he wanted to go home. He grew up in Youngstown, and I think he wanted to get away from that 
kind of stressful, you know, you know Nebraska style coaching life. And I, I think when the more you dig deeper, you realize, and again, I have my reservations. I have my questions about kind of what, what, how good he still is, how sharp he still will be against the top offenses in football. But you do just kind of have to remember like, well, he is a top, you know, he's considered a great defensive mind. LSU is paying him like that. I think he's, a, he's making 2.3 million a year, which is the second most in college football of any coordinator. And, you know, he was at Ojean's first choice, even before Aranda officially left when they thought he might leave. They they immediately said they wanted, you know, Bo Pelini. So he's going to move the defense to a four, three base, or at least a four man front. And I, I think it's going to be fascinating because yeah, we'll find out really quickly how up to date he is with modern football. I mean, you mentioned the change uh, to style of defense and the other big change, that linebacker core. Caleb Vaughn, Chase on Patrick Queen, Jacob Phillips, all all no part of this Tigers program. What's the general thought of, you know, replacing those guys and changing the defense at the same time? Yeah, it almost kind of works out in a way that they're replacing, all, you know, that they're switching at this time because, like you said, they're losing, you know, depending on what scheme they use on any given day. I mean, basically they lost four linebacker starters and, and that's obviously, you know, so now you're going to three linebackers and only if we're being honest. I mean, only two of them are, because I, I just think in modern football, LSU's probably going to play more of a four, two, five. That's just kind of how things yeah. go with. So, I mean, really you're only playing two linebackers most of the time. It actually is kind of a smart move considering I think LSU's defensive line depth is actually incredibly strong. and could be one of the, I would say is one of the three best defensive lines in the SEC going into 2020. So it makes sense in a lot of ways. And it's also backs up what Ed Ogeron really wants. And I think, I don't think, I think they had a great relationship, but I'm, I got, always have gotten the sense that Ogeron didn't love the way Dave Aranda's defense. He, he trusted Dave Aranda. He knew he was one of the best coordinators, but Ogeron deep down, I think wanted an attacking four man front that lets his defensive linemen get vertical and get upfield and attack and rush the passer, and instead of, you know, the last few years they've been playing that 3-4 where those linemen are more placeholders, holding blocks, and all that. So I think Ogeron really wants that, and it might free, and it might free things up for some of those linebackers. So they're, and to answer your actual question about replacing some of these guys, they're bringing in Jabril Cox, who transferred from graduate transfer from North Dakota State. I mean, he would have been – he was projected to be a third-round pick linebacker out of, out of the FCS. He's a really fast, speedy – sideline to sideline linebacker who's a you know all American for a national champion North Dakota State. So he's obviously gonna come in and be one of their main guys. And then they're really, really high on Damone Clark's potential. He's a you know six three, like two hundred fifty pound, just kind of freak athlete kind of guy at linebacker. Yeah, I know he, he had to learn a lot of the, the mental parts of being a linebacker and I'm, and I'm not confident he's where he needs to be there, but they're kind of betting on that because my guess would be those are the two primary linebackers in 2020, assuming he gets caught up. But yeah, they have some depth they like there. For example, Marcel Brooks, you might remember him from the Florida game against LSU where, you know, he had some big plays in that game and they kind of used him as like a hybrid safety outside linebacker type, almost like a Isaiah Simmons or something. And they're going to, they're moving him to be a true inside linebacker. going to see how that works out as an upside play. They have some depth there, but it'll be really interesting to see, who's really ready to be a main guy in this new defense, whether it's Damone Clark or Marcel Brooks or someone else. Brody, you mentioned that Florida game last year. Before I let you go here, of course, Gator audience, listening to this podcast, then Florida fought tooth and nail with LSU in, in Death Valley last year. Many people expecting Florida to take that jump in the SEC East this year and, and, and challenge Georgia. Uh, what do you see from the Gators uh, heading into 2020? I mean – I, I've been on your show before, and I'm, I'm always just very high on – if there's any coach in college football that I trust to get the most out of talent, it's almost always Dan Mullen. I just think that's you – know, I used to cover him when he was in Mississippi State. I mean, he is just one of the best at that. And I, I really liked what I saw from Kyle Trask. I, I think there's probably a ceiling to what Trask can be, but I think Trask has a chance to be one of the top quarterbacks in the SEC. And I think – I'm curious where you stand, but I, you can probably make an argument he's the best – you know, known commodity returning starter in the SEC. So I like Florida's chances. I always trust the Todd Grantham defense. And let's put it this way. If you ask me right now, you know, I think Florida's right there with Georgia. I consider them kind of even in my mind of who could win that game. And it's always a toss up. And obviously Dan Mullen's going to be judged hard until he actually gets by Kirby. But I mean, I think this Florida team has a chance to, to take the East. Always a fun time, Florida LSU meet up and Brody. Hopefully, hopefully we'll get to see you in Gainesville this fall. Everything, <laughs> every, everything plays out. Hopefully, the way you know we can and, and, and enjoy the game of football, man. But uh, stay safe and uh, thanks for uh, hopping on here and previewing LSU. Absolutely, anytime, man. Thanks for having me. Take care.
And joining us for our old Miss preview is Evie Van Pelt from the Rebel Walk. And Evie, I can't thank you enough for joining us here on Gators Breakdown. And look, we were all hoping to get to see Lane Kiffin this spring in Oxford, the, the polarizing figure he is. What's been the thought of, of you know the hiring of Lane Kiffin since uh, he, his initial opening press conference there in Oxford? Well, you know, it's funny. Um, I don't think really even the corona pandemic has uh, lessened Rebel fans' excitement for Lane Kiffin. So I think they're just chomping at the bit for football to get back in some way, shape, or form to see to see what he does. Um, surprisingly, I, I, mean, I mean, you would think that it would have been um, – a little more he is polarizing I mean he can be polarizing but interestingly the fans were very united and I think uh, in support for him and I think that part of that is if you just look at everything that Ole Miss has been through you know in, in, in the last I don't know five six seven years it's been uh, you know whether it was Hugh Freeze and NCAA and then you know, Coach Luke was just a phenomenal person, but, you know, four wins wasn't really going to cut it. So, um, anyway, I think that there was a, an enthusiasm about the Kiffin hire and, um, uh, you know, about Ole Miss possibly getting some attention for something that was positive you know, for a change. So, folks are still really excited about Kiffin and just, you know, waiting to see how what, what the landscape might look like. Uh, if we if we play football again anytime soon, yeah, the state of Mississippi, I tell you, they've uh, they hit the home runs. Uh, Mississippi State, <laughs> Ole Miss, you know, Mike Leach out there. What are you looking forward to? You know, th- those two going back and forth. I, I think you know we know enough that you know those get those two guys um, <laughs> aren't really going to right now at least, uh, play too much into the rivalry. They seem to be pretty good friends right. uh, for the fact right now. But I'm sure they'll learn pretty quickly how, how serious those fan bases take that rivalry. Well, you know, it's funny. I think that it's been kind of a complete reset. And frankly, I think it was needed. The, the rivalry had kind of just disintegrated into really just – craziness. I mean, I'm, I graduated from A&M, as you may know, and so I grew up with the A&M University of Texas Longhorns rivalry, and I've had many people ask me, you know, which is a, which is a, a more of a rivalry, and I mean, uh, that or a uh, Ole Miss and Mississippi State, and I mean, of course, they're both huge rivalries, but I've never seen anything like Ole Miss and Mississippi State. I mean, it, it, it gets down to a level where I mean, holy cow, I don't know if it's that they're so close in proximity or what. But but anyway, I think that these two coaches have a respect for each other. Um, I'm not sure we've had that in the recent past. Um, I think that they're looking at, at perhaps a, a bigger picture. And it's been it's been actually nice because let's face it, you know, the egg bowl was getting to the point where whether it was fights on the field or before the game or players refusing to shake hands or peeing in the end zone or, you know, whatever, <laughs> whatever. I mean, it had just to me, it had gotten to a, a toxic point where it just, eh, you know, it, it just really to me didn't embrace quite. The, the spirit of college football that, that I would like to see. So I think it's been really nice. Kiffin and, and Leach. Leach has uh, tweeted and Kiffin has made some, you know, funny tweets about, uh, you know, in Leach's direction, nothing insulting, you know, very complimentary. So I, I think it's actually going to be a good thing where we can get back to focusing on football in the game. And speaking of getting back to football, let's do, let's do that right here. And, 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 and one of the biggest questions in the SEC is is what happens at, at quarterback here at Ole Miss. Two options there for Kiffin. Uh, one, you know, Florida fans are so familiar with Matt Corral, former commit for the Gators, and then John Rice, John Rice Plumley, who came on the scene last year. So has Kiffin shed much light on how he sees the quarterback competition playing out? No, you know, it's really interesting. I mean, Ole Miss had absolutely, you know, we had no spring practice at all. So Kiffin hasn't, hasn't seen any of the, the players uh, in, in person, hadn't had a chance to work with them. And, you know, before Corona hit, John Rice Plumley and running back Jerry on Ely were playing baseball. They're both very good baseball players. And so there was a, a conventional 
thought there that Matt Corral was going to get, you know, the majority of the work in the spring by virtue of Plumlee being gone for baseball. So now you take a look at that, and when they do begin football again, they're going to be even. You know, I mean, Kiffin has not seen either one of them in person play football. So that's going to be interesting. I think that that actually kind of favors Plumlee because, um, you know, he'll be there. He won't be, he won't be absent. Um, but another thing that folks aren't even really thinking about is Grant Tisdale. And Grant Tisdale is a quarterback who came to Ole Miss very, very highly rated. I mean, he was uh, rated a four-star quarterback also. Partway through last season, decided he was going to transfer. He wasn't seeing playing time in Rich Rodriguez's scheme. And the only time he did, he came in against Alabama and, and, you know, was two for two and threw a beautiful, you know, touchdown pass against Alabama that was, you know, quite nice. Um, But he entered the transfer portal. Well, lo and behold, when Kiffin became the coach, um, Tisdale removed his name from the portal. So, that's kind of interesting. Uh, a lot of people think that he may, you know, he may have a good shot. So it's going to be really interesting to see. I think right now it's just, you know, to your question, Kiffin has not said really anything. He's spoken very little about the quarterback position. So, um, you know, which again, that makes sense. He hadn't had any practice with those two so um, or any of them. So anyway, it's, it's frankly anybody's guess at this point. If we move to the other side of the ball, look, we know that the Rebels' defense had its ups and downs uh, on defense last season, but only two starters are gone. And, and you know, are we expecting a leap there with co-coordinators and uh, another name Florida fans are, are familiar with, DJ Durkin, there at Ole Miss, and Chris Parchers uh, coming in. Co- co-coordinators, uh, how do you think that might work out there at, at, in Oxford? Well, I think that, uh, yeah, I think it's going to be really interesting to see how that goes. Yeah, uh, Chris Partridge, the former Michigan special teams coach, and DJ Durkin um, are going to be co-coordinators. And you're right, only two starters are gone, and that, you know, on the surface seems like a good thing. But we do have to keep in mind that they, um, you know, the, the secondary the secondary struggled last year uh the pass pass rush was wonderful 33 sacks on the season um but i think you know definitely the secondary secondary needed some work and i think that that's um one thing you know chris partridge has talked about um the the safeties and what it's been like you know again that it's when you look at it Ole Miss is at a disadvantage whenever football does resume after the corona situation because, you know, none of these kids have, you know, it's going to be new scheme, new coaches, totally new coaches. And so, you know, for more established teams of Florida and Alabama, you know, LSU folks that have their system and their players have been running it, it's one thing. But for Ole Miss, it's going to be a little, a little bit, a little bit different. So, um, I think what we're hearing is that um, they're going to probably go with a base 4-3 and, um, you know, maybe be, be a little multiple. Um, so we're not quite even sure where some of the, you know, some of the guys are going to going to end up based on the scheme. That's just kind of what we're, what we're hearing. So anyway, I mean, I think that they've got a lot of, a lot of talent coming back um you mentioned you know two losing two starters um so it's going to be interesting i think there's a lot of talented kids and a lot of players that you know everybody on every team is going to be so eager can you imagine to finally get back out and be able to play football whenever that does happen absolutely we're all, we're all waiting for that point and i'm sure uh old miss fans are probably waiting for this matchup against florida too and going against dan mullen again <laughs> uh, that, i'm sure that's yes. going to be uh, of course the big storyline whenever this game takes place is uh dan mullen going against his former <laughs> rivals there so if you want to spend your thoughts on dan mullen his two years at florida you know 21 wins uh you really you know trying to just turn in florida around right. from the jim McElwain era and are old miss fans excited to, to see him on the opposing sideline once again just coming up the oh, season I- I think definitely so, and I think they're definitely excited to be heading into battle against 
Florida with Lane Kiffin on the sideline as the head coach, <laughs> as opposed to maybe some others. But, I mean, boy, Mullen has done a fantastic job. I mean, what, 21-5 and five in the last two seasons? I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised if his third year – I mean, they'll be fighting in there for the SEC East. And I, I just think that, um, you know, Mullen's done an excellent job. I mean, he recruited – very, very well. I uh, recruited very well when he was at Mississippi State. Did a lot, a lot with, you know, sometimes less talent, I feel like, at Mississippi State. Um, did a lot with them. Had guys head to the pros. So I think Rebel fans, I mean, I'm excited. I mean, I'm I'm a little leery. I'm I'm a <laughs> of of uh, being in a stadium with, you know, sixty thousand people or, you know, maybe up in the press box. I don't know. I feel like that corona's lurking around. <laughs> but but I tell you what, to see to see a Lane Kiff and Dan Mullen match up, I will be there for sure. <laughs> I wouldn't miss that one. Yeah, I think there'll be a, a lot of a lot of good lines leading up to that game from both coaches. So. Oh <laughs> man, I I just can't even imagine. So yeah, I remember late Lane Kiffin's time at Tennessee took some jabs at Florida. So <laughs> the one yes. year, the one year he was there. So uh, I'm, yes, I'm, I think so. Yeah, I'm sure he'll and, have some. Uh, I'm sure he'll have some good one liners. Oh, I think it's you know that's that's the thing. I mean, Kiffin is entertaining. I mean, he absolutely is entertaining, and we've had a couple of we've had some Zoom uh, media opportunities with him, and uh, he he does not disappoint. All right, that is Evie Van Pelt from the Rebel Walk giving us a preview of these Ole Miss Rebels, the Gators, SEC West opponent this year, the ro- rotating SEC West opponent. So always a good time when the Gators and Rebels meet up. Evie, I can't thank you enough for joining us here on Gators Breakdown. Well, I can't thank you enough for having me. I sure appreciate it. A lot of good insight there from the first half of the schedule of Gators opponents coming up for 2020. As I said earlier in the episode, next week we will feature Georgia, Vanderbilt, Missouri, and FSU to round out our whip around coverage of Gators opponents for the 2020 season. And we'll uh, also hit... Some news and notes next week if there's uh, any big news uh, coming out of Gator Nation. Of course, we'll have you covered here on Gators Breakdown. Guys and girls out there, thanks for listening to this episode of Gators Breakdown.